Joe. So today Good we're morning. talking about social discovery and like what is social discovery? It's all about helping you find cool new things on the web. Um, and I think we're lucky to kick things off with a service, talking about a service that a lot, has helped a lot of us, probably everybody in this room, find cool new things in the web and that's Pandora. So Joe uh, Kennedy is the CEO and one of the earliest employees of Pandora. Um, we're gonna chat a little bit about kind of the engine behind Pandora and what they're seeing in the market for, for social discovery right now. I wanna start off um, with kind of the beginning of Pandora. It, Pandora grew out of something called the Music Genome Project. Can you tell us what that is for the people who don't know what that is? Sure, the Music Genome Project was something that Tim Westergren, the founder, came up with. And he came up with it precisely to solve the discovery problem. Uh, Tim uh, went to Stanford, uh, he studied something, uh, but music really was his love. Uh, and uh, spent the, the, the next 10 years following graduation from Stanford, uh, touring the Western US uh, with his band, Yellowwood Junction, that's the uh, trivia uh, answer to Tim, the name of Tim's band. Uh, and as he says, he got to know what it felt like to be a needle in a haystack. You know, he saw all sorts of bands that he felt were creating great music, but which were unable to connect with its audience. They hadn't been uh, discovered. And so he keenly felt um, what, it like, uh, what it was like to be that needle in a haystack. And the Music Genome Project was his answer to, to fixing that problem, which is how do you uh, take an understanding of um, what someone likes and connect them with music that not only they have never heard, but maybe no one has really ever heard of before. Uh, and that uh, led to a focus on the underlying attributes of music and could the underlying attributes of the music be used as a matching tool to go from known music that you like to unknown or new music. So from the very beginning, he's actually thinking about this from two ways, the, the bands that are, want to discover fans and, mm -hmm. and fans that want to discover new music. So it's kind of two, two paths yeah, of discovery. There are two on. sides of the exact same coin. In many ways, the motivation of Tim was from the artist side. How do we en enable um, bands to connect with and build their audience? But that's really the same problem as how do you help listeners discover and enjoy music that they love? It's the same problem, just two different lenses. So how does it work? Take us through the process. You get a song, kind of how do you, how do you get that into your Pandora engine? How do you genome a song? So uh, that's the foundation of, of, of what we do, the Music Genome Project. We have a team of music analysts. These are musicians with deep backgrounds in music theory. Uh, and then they spend their entire day analyzing songs. A typical song maybe takes 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, they'll look at about 400 potential dimensions of the song, 20 attributes just capturing the characteristics of the vocal. Is it nasal? Is it breathy? Male? Female? What range are they singing in? How much vibrato? How much twang? All of those things that give, a, you know, the difference between Tom Waits and Mariah Carey uh, is described by these 20 uh, attributes. What are, what's the melody, the harmony, the characteristics of the instrumentation, the production, the lyrics? All of that is captured uh, in this taxonomy, this gene set that forms the foundation of the Music Genome did, Project. Did Tom Waits and Mariah Carey have anything in common? I don't believe they have any genes in common. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, and then the next step is to to match these to other songs and create playlists. Right. So the 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 in in the earliest days, this is now 12 years ago. The company developed algorithms that said, well, if this set of attributes uh, is a song that we know that someone likes, uh, how can we develop an algorithm to introduce them to other music that they like based on the similarity of those attributes and. It's a tricky problem because not all of the attributes you know, have the same value. Um, the tempo is probably more important than the amount of cowbell. Uh, and kind of work through all of those problems to develop this matching engine, again, based purely on the musical attributes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so you're a musician yourself. There's Tim is a musician. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of kind of musical DNA in your company. Um, what, what, what goes into, what's behind the scenes? How are you doing genoming today? What does this look like um, today over at your headquarters in Oakland? It's, um, uh, you know, you, you see a bunch of people with headphones. People are always surprised when they come to Pandora that there's not loud music playing. There, there's lots of music playing, but it's very individual, uh, including what the analysts are listening to. The other interesting thing is that uh, We've had these analysts, there's, there's almost no turnover among these analysts because they are real working professional musicians with careers. Many of you have heard them perform in San Francisco, perform on recordings. Uh, and so actually many of them are hooking into us now by VPN. They might be on tour uh, and in the downtime are doing song analysis for us or they're you know, recording down in LA. Uh, and so it's, it's a very, at this point it's become a more virtual process. Mm. 
but we analyze about 10,000 songs a month. Uh, that gives us a really steady flow of great new music, obviously far, far, far beyond uh, just the major label that, mm -hmm. that uh, music that comes out, which is a tiny piece of that. Is, and is the volume of new music increasing? Uh, in terms of what we're ingesting, the about 10,000 a month is, is probably, you know, been relatively steady for the last few years. Uh, we do have a curation team that's separate from the analysis team. So there's about a half dozen people, and their sole job is to work with, um, you know, every information source they can to try and identify new music that's out there that's great music that people haven't come across before. And of course, the greatest uh, source of input that we have that begins to get to the social component uh, is we have you know, millions and millions of users every day who are typing in the names of songs and artists into Pandora. Uh, and a tiny, tiny fraction of a percent of the time, we don't have that song or artist. And that is our, our kind of uh, clue that something's breaking. Uh, there might be a song that, or a band that's just breaking on the University of Indiana uh, this spring, and no one knows about it outside of there, but we pick up the small number of inputs from the people looking for that band on that campus, uh, and the curation team will pick up that data, go chase down uh, that song. I want to get back to the, to the data component in a bit, but just to that point, if you're a ind young independent band and you want to get on Pandora, is there, what, what, is there, what should you do? Absolutely. There's there's online submission process. You can just, if you just Google kind of submit my music to Pandora, uh, we have instructions and we literally take uh, all submissions. Uh, every submission is listened to by the curation uh, team. And to give you a feel, we, we play the music of over 100,000 different artists, uh, over 70,000 of whom are independent. Uh, and a good portion of those have no label affiliation at all, not even a... a um, mm -hmm. Uh, independent label affiliation. So we are very much committed to finding that great music, uh, that needle in a haystack, uh, and creating that spark. Great. Um, so we're talking about social discovery, and uh, I want to get into kind of how this genoming process has evolved over the years. And recently, a lot of people don't realize this, but recently Pandora began customizing playlists to someone based on their geography and based on their age. So if, this is what you told me the other day, uh, if a 13-year-old in New York types in Taylor Swift, they're gonna get a different playlist than a middle-aged mom in Texas type, typing in Taylor Swift. Can you explain why that is and how that works? Yeah, and uh, in essence, again, we, we use all of the information that we have to try and provide the best uh, personalized experience to every uh, listener. Uh, and one way to think about it is that there's two parts to music discovery. Uh, one is, before you can have social discovery, before you can use the wisdom of the crowd, even if it's a small crowd, you have to create that fire, that initial spark, that Prometheus moment. Uh, and the Music Genome Project is incredibly powerful at creating those Prometheus moments, creating a spark, creating a fire where none exists at all. Prometheus uh, is the mythological character that stole, stole fire from fire. Zeus and gave it to mankind. Exactly. Right? Okay. Uh, so creating, creating the spark. But uh, the, one of the ways is, it, the, the truth is, it's easier to spread fire than it is to create fire where there isn't any at all. Uh, and we care passionately about discovery, and so we care about both pieces of those. Uh, and to a certain extent, you can think about the algorithms that we use in those two different buckets, that the Music Genome Project uh, is spectacular at enabling us to create fire where there isn't any at all. Uh, and then the fact that we, in essence, have the musical graph of 150 million plus people gives us an extraordinary opportunity to use that uh, in terms of, of spreading fire, of really enabling social discovery. Uh, and as Doug said, we take the feedback from each of you we use it to make your station better for you, first and foremost. We do that in real time, literally, after you give a thumbs up or a thumbs down, the next song that plays on Pandora might well be different, uh, different because of that feedback you gave us. But we also aggregate it. We aggregate it by looking at the intersections on the musical graph. Uh, and so uh, we look at all the people who have an intersection. They've told us they like Counting Crows. What can we learn about the right music for people who share an interest in Counting Crows? Uh, based on the intersections that we see in, in the musical graphs of different people. And then we can even cut that more finely, as you said, because there might be important, uh, even among all of those who have an intersection around Counting Crows, those who are, um, you know, live in San Francisco uh, in a certain age, 
will know the really early days of, of Adam and Company, uh, when they were just playing out of Berkeley, uh, and might have uh, an eagerness to hear really early stuff, maybe even uh, kind of the predecessor band before August and everything after, that might play for that sub-crowd, the right age, the right geography in Chicago, whereas someone in New York, um, older, different geography, you know, Counting Crows really means to them kind of August and everything after, and that um, uh, which followed. And so that's how we can powerfully use the musical graph that we have of all of our listeners and combine this power of kind of raw discovery, first spark discovery, uh, and social discovery to create hopefully a fantastic experience. Are there, are there, I'm just curious, are there any genres of music that are very difficult to wrap your head around or for your, for your engineers to wrap their head around and match with people? You know, there, there are hard uh, problems. I think you used the example of, of Taylor Swift. And, and Taylor Swift's a pretty interesting example because it might be easy to say, well, someone types in Taylor Swift, how hard can that be? Uh, because, you know, it's kind of country pop and play a bunch of country pop. Uh, and if you were uh, creating a station for my wife, for example, who tends to kind of like country pop, that's the right answer. But for my 13-year-old, Taylor Swift really exists as part of kind of a pop culture phenomenon. And, you know, not all of Top 40 would make sense next to Taylor Swift, but a whole bunch of Top 40 would make sense uh, that isn't really uh, in the category of country pop. Uh, and so we rack our brains constantly to use all of these different algorithms to figure out how do we use everything that we know to play the best song for just you? Uh, and that gets into to, you know, some of the various techniques that we've, we've had to explore that range from algorithms that are very social uh, in their orientation to, again, algorithms that are kind of musicological uh, in their orientation. Are there other, uh, going forward, and you do a lot of experiments, um, are there other pieces of data that might, uh, you might end up using in the future to inform this musical graph that you have for your users? You know, we, we don't put any bounds on what we might uh, use. We're, we're just absolutely kind of, um, you know, fanatic about how do we solve this problem better than anyone uh, uh, in the world. You know, I think an interesting technique that we don't happen to use today, uh, but there's another player out there who pioneered it, is just kind of, um, you know, crawling the web and finding associations uh, on the web using web crawling. And who's the pioneer uh, you're talking that about? Kind of Echo Nest. Okay. That's kind of the cornerstone of their technique. In and of itself, I don't think it's that powerful a technique, but in certain situations, that might be an incremental benefit. So I'm not saying we're going to go mm -hmm. chase that down, but it's, it, I, I think it's a great example that the opportunities to, to solve this problem, you know, our view is there's unbounded, and we're just beginning to scratch the surface of, of solving this problem. I think there is a view uh, that to a certain extent the first era of the internet was very much kind of a search and find mindset. Um, but I think we're all now looking kind of as the internet moves forward is how do, we, how do we use the internet for those experiences that are more about serendipity and discovery as opposed to I know what I want, how do I go find it? Sure, and that's uh, you know, a question that we're gonna be delving into more today with a lot of the companies here who are doing the same thing for news and the same thing for entertainment and products and location, so it'll be interesting to see what they think about that. I think particularly as you get into the world of kind of internet as the foundation of media entertainment, media entertainment is not all about search and find. A lot of media entertainment is about serendipity and discovery, and that really means kind of, uh, you know, the focus of this conference is incredibly ap apropos uh, as the internet is the foundation of the, the media entertainment experiences of more and more people. Does Pandora see opportunities beyond music? You've, you know, fine-tuned this algorithm for music. Could you go into movies or could you go into product discovery someday? You know, people ask us that uh, all the time, and I, I think th there's a lot of opportunities to maybe use some of the techniques that we've developed. But you know what? Our passion is around music, kind of as you alluded to. That's kind of the unifying characteristic of the bunch of us that came together uh, that really created uh, Pandora. And I'm a big believer that... Uh, if you're doing something that you have just incredible passion about, you're going to be better at it than something else. I mean, I, I enjoy movies, um, you know, at least as much as the next person, but I don't have that depth of passion around movies or books or other categories. So we'll leave that to people who have that extraordinary passion in those categories to take on those things, and we're just going to be laser focused and try and just be the, the best personalized mm -hmm. you know, music radio experience you can find. Um, so sticking with the topic of social, um, this musical graph we're talking about with Pandora 
is implicit and it's behind the scenes and you can't actually see the other people who kind of your Pandora is linking to me. Um, another company that's you know a competitor to yours that's really hot these days is Spotify. Mm -hmm. And so Spotify is doing um, a more explicit social graph where they're asking their users to post a song or a playlist to their timeline on Facebook or their newsfeed on Facebook. Um, do you, what do you make of this approach? And are you okay with being the less social music service? Yeah, I think, uh, again, I think, you know, the Facebook guys have a nice product, um, kind of solves a different problem from the, uh, the problem we, we solve. We are fundamentally entirely focused on this problem of, of how do you create a great serendipitous kind of discovery uh, based experience. A lot of Spotify is, hey, I want to hear, you know, the song by, um, you know, the new single by Train and I want to hear it now. Um, and, and they do have a number of, of uh, you know, social mechanisms that I think are interesting. We both have, I think, 10 million plus uh, people using an integration with Facebook every month. I think, you know, we, we sat down uh, and I think you were a little surprised if you look at app data uh, that you see a number around 10 million or more of Pandora users. Uh, it's that about are a quarter or a fifth of about, Pandora yeah, users. Between a fifth in. and a quarter of our users are, are actively using uh, our integration with Facebook. So uh, I think the only part of what you said that we, um, uh, we, we're not really on, on the same page of is that kind of we're, we're the not social or the less social. In fact, there's a tremendous amount of social uh, in, in Pandora, and it's evidenced by the, the use of our users. But we also do have users, and music is maybe a bit of a unique category. Some people really want their music taste to be you know, private, you know, that deep-seated love you have of ABBA, you're just not quite prepared to, to share with, you know, the rest of the world. And that's okay, and, and a lot of people have those. And so um, the one thing that really has guided us as we've learned and experimented with social uh, is that it's very segmented. And we, you know, there's, there's different segments for whom there's different uh, solutions. And again, when it comes to this core challenge, though, of discovery that's at the center of what we're about, we have found, though, that uh, it's not really about the people you know. Um, the people uh, who have intersections with your musical graph, that's actually where the greatest discovery learning can come from, uh, the vast majority of whom you probably don't uh, even know exist. Mm. Hmm. Um, one more question on Spotify. It's Bloomberg has reported and others have reported that they are looking at um, talks with the labels in terms of creating a Pandora-like radio service. Um, do you, how do you think that they'll fare and are you worried about them attacking your core business? Well, you know, we've, we, we've had tremendous competition since the day we, uh, the day we launched. Uh, some of you may not remember this, but when we launched six and a half years ago, Yahoo LaunchCast was the biggest player uh, in internet radio, they also had on-demand services. Uh, AOL was the second biggest player. MSM was the third biggest player. Uh, they're all now effectively out of the internet radio business. Uh, and you know, the on-demand services, Rhapsody, Rhapsody's existed, you know, uh, you know, was was started before us. Has always had an online uh, uh, personalization feature, as as Music Match. Some people might remember Music Match, uh, and so. Uh, I think you know it would be very common for Spotify to have some radio functionality, but again, we're focused on just that problem. It's a very unique and wickedly hard problem, uh, and our focus is on doing solving that problem better than anyone in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we have some questions from Twitter. I'm going to get to in a second. Um, I want to talk about a, a, a hot topic at the moment, and that's mobile ads. Um, so you know, a lot of People are beating up on Facebook because, you know, and, and a lot of, frankly, a lot of web companies are, are dealing, grappling with this problem of my users are all going to the mobile phones, mobile devices, my advertisers are not following at the same pace. Pandora is sort of sitting in a good, look, good spot right now. You just reported 55% of your advertising revenue, more than half of your advertising revenue is from mobile ads. What have you guys figured out that no one else is? Well, um... I think there's a little bit of necessities of the mother of invention here in that I think we've been at very much the forward edge of this in that, um, uh, as was alluded to in the opening remarks, we now have more than 70% of our usage on mobile. So to a certain extent, we've spent the last three or four years going through this transition that other players are really just getting deeply uh, into. And so we've tried to bring a lot of creativity uh, uh, to it. 
Uh, and I think there's you know two main things that have enabled us to have you know um, we had more than 100 million of mobile revenue last year. I think we're second only to Google. Uh, it's 55 percent of our ad revenue. And I think the two keys for us is um, we're a pretty big player on the desktop web, and we're a huge player in mobile. Uh, and we've worked very carefully with the top digital advertisers who really want to learn how to speak with their target customers in mobile as well as on the web. They know that's where their target customers are spending more and more time. Uh, and we've really worked to offer them multi-platform solutions, kind of enabling them to speak across our entire base, uh, whether that's on the desktop, whether that's uh, on uh, Android, whether that's on an iPad. And we've had more and more success with that. We actually have a majority of the top 50 national digital advertisers uh, buying multi-platform on Pandora. Uh, and then the second thing uh, is that we do have a small amount of audio advertising uh, on Pandora. And that's a, that's a unique kind of opportunity for us because we are an audio service. But it is interesting that, that the category of audio advertising has always been device agnostic. I mean, you know, people didn't buy radio ads you know, on the clock radio, but not in the car, or vice versa. Uh, and so we do participate in a category uh, that has kind of been device agnostic and you know, is used to running lots of ads on things that look like uh, this kind of uh, form factor. So on the strength of those two, I think we've made a lot of inroads uh, in, into mobile. And, and we believe, though, that you know, it's just the beginning of mobile advertising. It's going to be an enormous uh, segment. Are the concerns about Facebook overblown? Do you think that they'll figure this out? Uh, you know, we, we have so much going on. I don't, uh, I leave it to you and others to kind of comment on, on Facebook. Uh, you know, we have a business that, you know, we just announced we're, we're, we, uh, we grew our listenership 87% uh, year on year uh, in, in May. So we're, we're pretty consumed about that. And, you know, there's wonderfully brilliant people at Facebook. I'd be hard pressed to bet against them, but we don't really follow the details of that. Okay. Um, the question from Twitter is where on the planet, um, and remember Pandora is only in the US, so where in the country actually is Pandora experiencing the most growth? Our, our growth really, I mean, we, we went through an early phase that was very much kind of coastal, kind of, kind of the, 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 the early adopter part of uh, the internet, but with 150 million plus registered users, and we had, we just announced uh, over 53 million uh, users just in the last month, we pretty much now look like the country, um, at least the internet part of the, the country. We have, all, obviously we have the coasts, but, uh, you know, we're every bit as strong in kind of the, you know, in between the coasts as we are on the coast. And I think you could, we could really see, because we, we're a registered user-based service, we have demographic information and zip code information on all of our users, we could really see that transition from the early days, more men than women and very, you know, on the coast, and now, you know, 50-50 uh, split between men and women uh, and uh, pretty much a mirror image of internet connected America. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, the, the last question is, um, you know, I'll throw it out to you. Um, we're talking about discovery today, and as you mentioned, you know, serendipity in many different parts of our lives is becoming important, and the internet is driving a lot of that. If you had to make a prediction about what social discovery or what web-based discovery will look like in three to five years, what, what would you say? Uh, I, think, I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity in discovery. I think we've just kind of you know, begun to scratch the surface of the potential there. And I think, again, from my frame, people are more and more viewing the internet as foundation to their kind of media and entertainment uh, experiences. And the combination of uh, the personalization potential of the, the internet, it's a one-to-one -one connection, uh, that the, the opportunity for people to figure out is how to get discovery right, not you know, en masse, but how do you get discovery right for each individual user and provide on that personalized basis just a fantastic, you know, serendipitous discovery experience I think there are so many categories that could benefit from that. Again, it's this combination of personalization uh, and discovery and serendipity that, that I just think will define uh, certainly media entertainment in five years, 10 years, 20 years, uh, and a whole bunch of categories beyond that that I don't uh, think a whole Outside lot Outside of Pandora, who, who, do you, who, who do you admire in this space? Well, you know, certainly, you know, Netflix really, uh, 
you know, it's, it's in media entertainment, focus a great deal on personalization, uh, in this combination of kind of discovery and personalization, how do you get the, the, the recommendations that are right uh, uh, for you? So I, th I think they remain, uh, you know, a, a really big important player that I think has, has kind of paved the way in terms of, of potential here. Um, Joe, we're out of time. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. I won't tell anyone about your love of ABBA. All right. It's, it's our Thank secret. You. It's our secret. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank you.